Pop quiz. Pop quiz. Take out your pens, your papers. Do not look to the right or to the left of those who are writing in class with you today. Question number one, in 300 words. <laughs> define the essence of marriage. Bonus points if it's biblical. Question two, in your own words, in a singular sentence, write down the purpose of marriage. Bonus points if it aligns with what Jesus said. And question number three, list out in no particular order the blessings that flow out of the essence and purpose of marriage. How'd you do? <sighs> Here's what's interesting. People get into the plane of marriage without the ability to define or explain the essence of it or articulate the purpose of it or understand the blessings that flow from its essence and purpose and then they fly the plane into the mountainside and blame the crash on the plane. They blame the crash on the marriage, on the institution and the relational institution of marriage while they readily acknowledge they don't have a clue about it. One more question. What are the top 10 reasons you think people in your generation in this day we live in are giving for the reason that marriages fail? What are the top 10 reasons that your friends, your peers are giving as to the reason for which the plane flies into the mountain. These, these are the, the unavoidable nuclear bomb bunker buster missiles that got fired on our marriage that we simply couldn't recover from. The pain was so great. The dysfunction was so severe. We had to step away in order to survive. What do you think those reasons are? I'm going to give you to them. I'm going to give them to you. <laughs> Number one. Lack of family support and dysfunctional nosiness from in-laws. That's literally the number one reason that, that people get. 43% of people in a Forbes magazine survey said they got divorced because of the toxicity of the family above them. Parents, if you needed any conviction over how involved you should be and any, any check into how nosy you should get, let this just, just fire a warning shot over the battle of your life. You might need to back up a little. Because when your son or daughter gets married, they're not joining your family, they're starting a new family. And if you put pressure on them to be a part of your family, you're going to draw them up into the dys dysfunctional enmeshment of your family, and their marriage has a 43% chance, chance of, of blowing up. How about number two, infidelity or extramarital affairs? Number three, lack of compatibility. We just, we just aren't compatible anymore. See, this is what I love about this. You think when you got married, if you base the marriage on on finding my soulmate, and then you wake up three years later realizing you married the devil <laughs> herself? <laughs> Third service, my fourth time, I'm going to get sporty. <laughs> or fourth service, yeah. Third service today, fourth service this weekend. And then you realize she's not my soulmate anymore. You think, you know what? We're just not compatible anymore because you think I married the wrong person. Newsflash, bro, you always marry the wrong person. All of y'all are all the wrong person. There's no world where you marry a sinner and go, oh, this was a match made in heaven. No, it starts as a match made in hell, and then you work up to heaven. <laughs> right? So stop looking for the perfect person. Start becoming God's person. Lack of compatibility. Lack of intimacy. Too much conflict or arguing. Just can't take it anymore. Just, just, I need to avoid this. I need to get away from it. 
financial stress, lack of commitment, parenting differences, opposing values and morals, and then down the very bottom of the list, 3%. And I highlight this, not to say this isn't legitimate, and not to say there aren't certain exceptional scenarios where decisive intervention is needed, but the very bottom, 3% substance abuse and or domestic violence, physical, sexual, or emotional. See, we like to teach the exception. Well, marriage is this patriarchal, oppressive relational system that creates abusive scenarios for women, and your generation is saying that only happens 3% of the time. See, the lie that the, that the culture is preaching to our generation is that marriage, as God intended it to be experienced in its essence and purpose, is by design oppressive, by design broken. What's amazing about this is it's the same lie that Satan brought to Adam and even the garden when he said, did God really say? Can you really trust him? Don't you think this is going a little too far? See, Satan's got no new playbook when it comes to ruining people's lives. Same old lies, different generation of suckers. I highlight these for you because if you don't understand the purpose for which you were married and the essence of marriage itself, many of the reasons that you'll give for why you got married or what marriage is supposed to be end up becoming the very reasons that you list for your divorce. Marriage was supposed to be where my needs are met and my soul is fast satisfied in my spouse, and now I'm dissatisfied, so the essence of marriage failed me, I'm out. Or the purpose to which I got married was, was to... Uh, have a soulmate and experience compatibility and whatever, and that's not working, so I'm out. Or we got married so we could have financial stability, and now that's gone, and we're out. Or we got married so I could have kids and find delight in raising children and find my identity in my parenting, and when that went to hell in the hat basket, so did our marriage. On and on and on we go, and if we don't get the essence of marriage right or articulate the purpose of marriage biblically, then the very reasons that you might think are good that you gave as a definition for marriage or the purpose for which your marriage exists can actually become the very reasons, ironically, that you punch out of marriage. And so we gotta, we gotta have an honest conversation about, no, 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 what is the essence of marriage as God designed and what is the end to which God designed marriage to function so we can have a starting place that has any shot of success. So what is the essence of marriage? What is the purpose of marriage? And what is the blessing of marriage is our outline for this morning's study. And I start here in Genesis. Maybe you're watching online, you're new to Grace City, you're new to Christianity, you're just checking this Jesus thing out, or maybe you've been coming for a while but still aren't clear on all of those things that are important to the tenets of our faith. And here's what I would tell you. The heart of Christianity can be found in this book. We view this book as authoritative. We view this book as God's spoken word to us. When we come to this book, we believe we're reading the words of life and it's explaining the world we live in. Because fundamentally, we as Christians don't think we should trust ourselves. We believe in the fallen nature of man, that we are sinful by nature and by choice, and that our opinions are, are famously unpredictable and untrustworthy, and that we regularly get things wrong, and that we should not trust our inclinations or our uh, intuitions all the time. And so we put ourselves under this word to submit ourselves to this word by saying, I don't think I see everything right, and so I need help to see things the way they are, so we come here. And the first book of this Bible, in the first chapter of the first book, the first four English words encapsulate the Christian worldview. Did you know that? What are the first four English words of the book of Genesis? In what? Yes! 
You got it. In the beginning, God. That is the starting point of Christianity. Before we were, God was. Before I formed an opinion, God formed the universe. Before I th- had an intelligent sentient thought, God's intelligence was, was existing. Before I was caused, God was there as the uncaused cause. Before I formed an opinion, God formed the world. Therefore, I should submit what I think to what he says. Amen? That's just the starting point of Christianity. And in the book of Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God. And then it unpacks for two chapters how we got here. God's creating the rivers that we swim in and the lakes that we ski on and the hills that we hike on, the mountains that we ski down. He's creating the world that we live in. And he's doing all of these things and and it's good and it's good and it's good. And then he gets to mankind as the crescendo of his creation. He makes Adam and he steps back and he goes, eh, (laughs) eh. And then he does something unique that he did with no other creation. Rather than speaking ex nihilo, something from nothing, he goes to that which already existed in Adam And he takes from Adam a rib. And he forms now the woman who is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And symbolically, he takes it from the side of Adam so that the relationship would not be one where he follows her walking in front of him, thanks be to God, or she follows him walking behind him, thanks be to God. But they walk side by side together through life as partners. And then God comes down and performs the first marriage ceremony in the garden, steps back and looks at this new institution that he just inaugurated in marriage between one man and one woman. He speaks over them the blessing of be fruitful, and they are off and running, and God goes, oh, that is really, really good. And then spiritual warfare happened, and Satan attacked. And you can't miss the fact that Satan didn't show up when the dolphins were there. And Satan didn't attack when the orcas were there. And Satan didn't attack the elk and the anteaters. Satan didn't even attack Adam. It wasn't until Satan looked away, looked back, and saw God the Father overseeing a marriage. He thought, holy smokes, i got to attack that. Why? 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 Because in marriage, Satan saw the most complete and robust and powerful re-imaging of the triune Godhead in the world that God had made. He saw God the Father as overseeing the establishing of the relationship. And then he saw God the Father call the man into it and say, you are now to function as head, selflessly and sacrificially loving her. And then he saw God call the woman into the relationship and say, you are now existing here and called to be helper in how you nurture him. And what Satan saw was God the Father and then a representation of God the Son in the head and God the Spirit and the helper. And he saw in that triune relationship of marriage the image of God being most fully imaged to the world. And he thought, I got to attack that. Because in marriage, Satan saw his demise. And so we attacked it. And so, friend, if, if you don't understand the essence of marriage and the purpose for which marriage was given, you may be building your relationship on a faulty foundation. And so what I want to do today is I want to look together at the essence, purpose, and blessing. And here's the thing. Whether or not you pass the pop quiz five minutes ago it doesn't mean you're not taking it every day. You take the pop quiz every day, and it's my hope that this morning will give you resources to take that and more fully. So what is the essence of marriage? I want to answer it with a story. This is Jim and Laverna Henderson. I got corrected this morning. When I talked to them last, this was true. It's now outdated. They have been married, for count them, 70 years. 70 years. And they sat right here this morning when I asked this sweet, dear couple, 
Hey, what could you tell me about, how do you, how do you, I, 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 you've been married significantly longer than I've been alive on the earth. How did you do it? To which Laverna always responds in a very sweet way, and this is me paraphrasing her. Well, you know, the first 25 years were pretty rough. <laughs> but the last 45 have been so, so sweet. My marriage advice would be to hang in there. It's worth it to stick it out. And in that sweet little answer is the essence to which God would teach us and point us this morning in that marriage is promise. Law number one, the law of preeminence, Jesus first, spouse second. Law number two, the law of promise, come hell or high water, we stay. Come hell in a, from attack or high water from trial and tragedy, we will choose to stay. Think about it. The first 25 years were pretty rough. We had nosy in-laws and personality incompatibilities, and we had uh, lots of... Um, Conflict and financial stress, and there was a lack of commitment on each of our parts at different times, and we had parenting differences, and we had opposing moral values, and there was occasionally some substance abuse. Literally, they could go down the line, and they could give you the reasons that made it miserable was all the reasons why people leave marriage, except they chose to stay, and the last 45 have been sweet. Why? Because God designed marriage to get better and better and better if you apply the laws to marriage, no matter how late you start applying them. Hello? <laughs> Amen? Anybody? You have good news to anybody in the house? And it's not like, well, you didn't start applying them, so you're host. It's like, start applying them right now, and the blessings immediately begin to flow. The first 25 years were pretty rough to which almost any counselor or therapist today would say, you don't deserve that. That's going to cause you mental health issues and blah, blah, blah. And we need to put you on this medication and that medication and yada this and yada that. And then we need to create distance and step out. And this is a toxic, patriarchal, oppressive, authoritative system that's putting you in this abusive situation. And just, just gaslight these lies into these hurting people who are vulnerable who then think the only chance they have to survive is to step away from the one thing God designed to actually save and sanctify them. Because marriage was not given primarily for your comfort, it was given for your holiness. And when we step away from the fire, we short-circuit the sanctification process. So, let me contrast for us what marriage is not, because there are a lot of bad definitions and commonly practiced definitions of marriage that we need to clarify marriage is not. Marriage is not, number one, casual. We're, we're all about casual relationships these days, aren't we? Not a big deal, come and go, up in the air, zero boundaries, whatever goes. The primary question of a casual relationship is, Am I still free to pursue other options? The primary priority is no commitment and ultimate flexibility. And the primary orientation is fundamentally self. This is not marriage. Nor is marriage convenience. We're here because it works. It's easy. I'm here. You're here. I need stuff. You need stuff. Doesn't require much work. It's not hard. It's cheap. It's easy. It's convenient. The pressing question each individual asks in this relationship is, is this still easy and my best option? <clears throat> I'm articulating this because you've ever, if you've ever asked this question in a relationship before, you're not in a marriage. You're in a relationship of convenience. The priority is my ease and my comfort. The primary orientation is fundamentally self. This is not marriage. Marriage is not consumeristic, marked by what I can get and take, not what I can give and offer. What do you have for me today? Willing to bargain. Everything is solid as long as I get a good product. 
for a fair price. <clears throat> the pressing question is, is this still working for me or are there better products available if I had the time to shop a little harder? The priority is the needs of the individual and the primary orientation is taking from the other in order to satisfy, name it, self. This is not marriage. Or how about contractual? Marriage is not contractual. This is why people re re rejected, <clears throat> I don't need marriage, it's just a piece of paper. I have found my soulmate. We are in love. And we know it's going to last because it's just as real as the last eight times I tried it. <laughs> I don't need a paper to show my love. We have hot sex. We have a connection at the soul level. No, sweetheart, you have delusion <laughs> over what you think you bring to the table. No, dude, you're confused about how you think this is going to work. In a contractual relationship, it's a bilateral agreement voluntarily formed, maintained, and dissolved at will by two individuals. Clear stipulations, whereas upon violation, the other is released from obligation to perform their end of the bargain. The pressing question here is, is the other person still holding up their end of the deal? The priority are the rights of the individuals, and the primary orientation is examining the performance of the other so as to protect, say it now. Self, this is not marriage. So you say, well, what is marriage? Marriage is, at its essence, covenantal. It's covenantal. Old fancy Bible word that you need to come to love. It is covenantal in its nature and essence. And you might ask, well, what does covenantal mean? To which I respond, I'm glad you ask. Fundamental to covenant is not the needs or the desires of the individuals, but of the new relationship formed. The needs of the relationship trump the immediate needs of the individual. It's marked not by what I can take, but what I can give. The relationship's needs are the priority. The pressing question is not an examining, are they doing their job, but a reflective, am I being faithful and true? The priority is the needs of the relationship are higher than my own individual needs of self. And the primary orientation is one of serving the other in love. And then you can hear just a postmodern, godless, demonic, woke pushback. But I, I need to worry about my own mental health. No, that's your problem. This grotesque, deluded, Hyper-focus on self is part of the mental disorder where all you're trying to do is get your needs met, which is trying to do the impossible, fill up a bucket with no bottom, and then when it doesn't fill up, you blame everyone else around you, and now you're just a peach to be married to. <laughs> there is something inherent in our physiology and our biology and our emotional relational makeup that brings health into our life when we look to meet the needs of others. It can be broken, it can be perverted, yes and amen, but it can also be redeemed to love and build someone else up even as it does the same for us as we look to the needs of the other over the needs of ourself. That's the nature of a covenant relationship. You say, well, where did you get this, Josh? Well, I got it from this guy named Jesus. In Matthew 19, verse 4, he's being asked about the nature and essence of marriage, and he responds with this teaching. Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning, the Creator, he's pointing back to Genesis 1 and 2, made them male and female. Woo! So controversial. We're not even out of the shallows of like basic elementary logic and biology, and we're already into controversial waters in our day, which should tell you something about the juvenile nature of our culture. 
He made them binary categories of male and female with no sliding scale. Male and female, and he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. End quote. And then Jesus repeats it in his own words. So they are no longer two, but one. Just repeating that to make sure he didn't miss what's happening here. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. What Jesus is doing is he's echoing what Moses has said in Genesis, of which Paul will pick up and echo in Ephesians. And we have here the totality of the teaching of Jesus on marriage, to which I'm submitting, if Moses said it, and Paul said it, and Jesus said it, you should consider listening to it. And in this definition, we have the essence of marriage given to us. And I've put it in a sentence, and this is more than you can write down, so take a picture or sign up for House News. I'll send you my notes tomorrow. Do not panic. Here it is. <laughs> marriage is a sacred, holy, permanent, exclusive, binding, weighty, intimate, covenant relationship between a man and a woman established before God, by God, entered into through the public exchanging of vows and attended with blessings for keeping the promise and curses for breaking the promise. That is what marriage is. How'd you do in your pop quiz? There's a sense of holy weightiness to this that we lose when all the focus goes into the wedding day and almost no attention goes into preparing for the actual marriage. So let's take this piece by piece through the text. Number one, covenant marriage is sacred. What God has joined together. Do not miss what's happening. When I stand before a couple, I do not say, and now by the power vested in me through the state of Washington, I proclaim you man and wife. <laughs> the state has less than zero say over a marriage. God defined it. God created it. God enacts it. Because when we get married, we're not signing a piece of paper a new being is being formed. That There is a new creative work where the one and the one now become one. It's this crazy cosmic math where they are no longer two, they are one. It is profound mystery and beauty, and it is done as an act of God. That's what God does. When we are at... The altar. This is why I get a, a I'm so obnu I should this is welcome to fourth service where just Josh goes on the hip. This is why I am annoyed by photographers sticking their nose in our business. Take your pictures from the back. This is a holy moment. No clickety click click click. Put the blank phone down and the camera down, and let's have a few moments of arrested attention where we experience. God forming something new and birthing into the cosmos a new being, namely, no longer she, no longer me, it is now we. That is what a marriage is. It is sacred, it is holy, because it is done by God. <laughs> Second, marriage is permanent. Look at the text. What God has joined together, let no man separate. Not nosy in-laws, not self-centered spouses. This is a command that comes with attended blessings when it's obeyed and consequences when it's violated. What God does when he joins a man and woman together is he gives them this gift called sex. And sex is the great covenant consummator where a man and a woman consummate their marriage with the act of sex 
And it becomes not only the covenant consummator, it becomes the great and wonderful covenant renewal service that continues to renew and bind each other to each other. And the way God designed it, it's unique. It's not as if you were nailing two boards together and if it didn't work, we can just pry the, 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 the boards apart and they're, they're individual boards again. No, no, it's more like taking two boards, gluing them together, putting them under great heat and stress and pressure through hydraulics and pressing them together until the glue dries so that when they come out from the forge, it is not one board, it is not two boards, it is now a new kind of board. The two have become one. It is stronger than it was previously, and you can't separate it without destroying both individual boards. I don't care why you got divorced or, or, or what horrible circumstances you were potentially getting away from, it was still utterly destructive on both of you as individuals. And yes, there's grace. And yes, there's mercy. And yes, there's redemption and salvation. And there are consequences that attend the tearing of those two boards. It'd be like putting two pieces of paper together and gluing them together. You don't take it apart and they each stay the same. You're like, well, this is depressing. Well, that's why you need to stay to the end. Because of what marriage was given as the purpose for. Marriage is permanent. Marriage is intimate. And the two shall become one flesh. This is not just a sexual reality where two bodies gloriously, magic, magically fit together. This is, this is sp spiritually as well where two have now become one and it's renewed and it's metaphored in this sexual act where before... Let me say this. God gave sexuality as a gift to be experienced without shame in marriage, and all other expressions of sexuality should be accompanied with great shame. If we're going to lie up the internet today, let's just go whole hog, full send. <laughs> we have done ourselves a great disservice in working hard to remove shame from sexual sin, calling it mental health. Friends, the prophet said, have you no shame? And that wasn't a compliment. He was saying, you are doing things and saying things and participating in things that should make you wildly uncomfortable and cause you to feel, feel great, great condemnation and shame so that you would turn away from it so as not to continue participating in its destruction. When you remove shame from shameful things, you're not helping people you're participating in their ongoing destruction. But we don't stay in the place of shame because what shame does is shame should push us toward the cross where at the foot of the cross, Jesus graciously removes our shame and speaks a better word over us saying, there is, now for, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So don't remove shame ourselves with medication and Wellness therapy, we remove shame by repentance of sin and receiving of grace. And then maybe, yes, we do work some of those through some of those things because the human body is a complex machine to break, but we don't start with therapy, we start with salvation. So marriage is intimate. The two shall become one flesh. Where that sexual experience is shared between the two without shame, naked and unashamed. Where I can be deeply... I can be intimately known and deeply loved. Marriage is exclusive. And the, count them, two shall become one flesh. Men, when you look at pornography, it's three. Or nine or 400. <laughs> Women, when you fantasize about the guy that, at work who listens to you like your husband doesn't, that's three, not two. When you bring anyone else into the relationship, sexually, emotionally, relationally, mentally, through fantasy, or physically, in reality, you are violating and breaking and damaging your marriage covenant that is to be exclusive between you and God and your spouse. 
Is there forgiveness? Yes. Is there healing? Yes. Is there salvation, redemption? Yes, 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 and yes. Thanks be to God. But that doesn't mean we presume on it and play fast and loose with our covenant relationship. The two shall become one flesh. It's public and vow-based. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, pretty public, and be joined to his wife, assuming she left them too. The assumption is they can't become one unless they've both left. The demonic lie is, yeah, don't leave and cleave. Just join our family and we'll do sick enmeshment dysfunction. It'll be great. 43% of marriages fail using that as its primary source. Man leaves, woman leaves, they unite in a vow-based ceremony where they say, I'm committing to be here come hell or high water. I'm assigning myself a date with you in 25 years. Whether or not you want to be there or I want to be there, I'm going to be there. And lastly, covenant marriage is we, the two will become one flesh, as I've already said. It's not her, it's not I, it's now us. It's not that one, it's not this one, it's now y'all. And your job is to farm y'all. Your job is to farm your we, protect your us. Because if you don't, lastly, marriage as a covenant relationship is consequential. And this is what we don't get in our no-fault divorce culture. Well, you don't want it to be hard to get out of a bad marriage, do you? Yeah. Because there are worse things than being in a bad marriage. And are there exception clauses that Jesus allows for? Those can be talked about and argued. Adultery, abuse, abandonment, yes and amen. But in those cases, the the covenant has been so mangled and destroyed. I can think of <clears throat> four, maybe five, Adam can help me, situations in 25 years where we've given that counsel. Because people too quickly and too easily punch out of what could have been redeemed and restored had they stayed and been willing to say, gosh, the first 25 years, pretty rough. So they could experience, but the last 45, woo, they've been sweet. What is covenant? We don't have categories to understand covenant in our, in our, in our day and age where we sell cars over text messages. But in ancient times in the Old Testament, when you're living out in the desert and you have a tribe and there's one source of water and there's a warring tribe and you're losing families and troops and resources, fighting over it, tribes would come together and they would make a covenant. And what would happen is they would say, okay, we're in a rough spot. It's hard to live in the desert. Let's make a covenant together to be in covenant relationships so that your resources become our resources, our resources become your resources, your weaknesses we supplement with our strength and vice versa so that we can, rather than kill each other off in a war of attrition, we can build each other up and be stronger together so as to ward off hell when it attacks in warring tribes or high water when trials and tragedy come. Rather than killing each other off over this single well, let's enter into covenant. And because we were formerly enemies slash non-ideal soulmates, Let's have a covenant that's bigger than us and deeper than us, protect us from each other so that we can actually be a blessing. And so they would take animals and they would tear the animals in half. And in a great act of violence, with the smell of death in the air and the sight of blood everywhere, they would place the animals side by side and then the two heads of the tribe would come together and in a symbolic act of becoming one, they would walk down the center aisle to establish their covenant so as to say, 
let what's been done to these animals be done to me if I violate this covenant. Before God and all of the witnesses, anyone here, friend or foe, has permission, in fact, obligation, to do to me what has been done to these animals if I do not hold up my end of the deal. Talk about motivation to keep covenant. Come hell or high water for my own health, I'm going to act for your benefit. Do you feel the weight of this sacred, holy, permanent, exclusive, binding, weighty, intimate covenant relationship between one man and woman performed before God and by God entered into through a public exchange of vows with attended blessings for keeping the promise and curses for breaking the promises that presents a kind of weight and instills a kind of gravitas into the essence of marriage that maybe, possibly, I gently suggest we're missing today. Because we give no thought to the marriage, put all of our money to make the day amazing, and then we bob down the aisle to Beyonce. <laughs> and we wonder why our marriages don't last. Because even in the ceremonies, we're mocking the holy sacredness of that moment. That's the essence of marriage. That it's fundamentally a promise that you make and that you then ask God for the grace to keep. And in so doing, you are now entering into the sanctification process of God. Because when you band two sinners together with covenant, boy, howdy, it's going to get Western. Did you know that? It's going to get Western. And there's only two outcomes to that relationship. Either they kill each other or they figure out a way to make it work. Uh-huh. Sanctification. Holiness, not comfort. At the heart of the essence of covenant marriage. By God's grace, may there be a holy weight put back into the heart of the people of Grace City Church that marriage might be honored among all and elevated not as this idolatrous relationship I get all my fundamental needs met through, but a holy institute got put in place for our blessing that can be trusted. Which leads then to the purpose of marriage. Because essence, purpose always flows from essence. You were made in the image of God. That's your essence. You're an image of God bearer. And from the nature of that image bearer flows the purpose of you as an individual. So too from the essence of marriage's covenant relationship flows its purpose as a promise-keeping, promise-proclaiming institute to a promise-breaking world. And here's why it's important for you to understand. I'll ask Christian couples all the time. So do you believe, uh, this is back when I did counseling. Thankfully, that phase of my life is over. But I used to do that. And I would ask Christian couples, do you think God brought you together? Do you know what they always said? Yes. Then I asked the second question. Why do you think God brought you together? Blank stares, no clue. Oh, we believe God brought us together. We just don't have a clue why. And you wonder why you're wandering. See, friends, if you don't got a why that's bigger than the hell or high water that will come against your marriage, your marriage will falter. Your marriage will wander. Your marriage will stumble. Which means the principle is you got to have a purpose for your marriage bigger than the stress that's going to get put on it. 
And this is what I referenced earlier. Why'd you get married? Oh, do we have, we, we, so we can have kids. Until you realize you can't have kids. And now the reason and the purpose for which you got married has been taken away. Now what do you do? It's ironic that any purpose lesser than this can become the reason for which you end the marriage, which is why you need the, the purpose of God at the foundation of your marriage. And we get this from Paul in Ephesians chapter 5. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. And then in the rhetorical genius of Paul, he takes a, a play out of Jesus' teaching playbook, and he's going to go, okay, that which you know and understand, I'm not going to use to bridge the gap to that which you don't quite yet comprehend. Jesus said, see that well of water? I'm kind of like that, except infinitely better. Paul says, see marriage that you understand is as beautiful, just uncomprehensible, incomprehensible human relational mystery? That's actually not what I'm talking about. He says, I'm talking about Christ in the church. What's he saying? What he's saying is marriage was given as a relationship to image to the world the kind of unfailing, never stopping, always faithful, covenant keeping love that God has for you through Christ. Which means God was saying, every time my kids see me love my wife sacrificially, and every time my kids see my wife forgive me, even though I didn't deserve it, they're seeing the good news of the gospel gospel proclaimed. So your marriage exists to display to your spouse, your children, your children's children, your neighbors, your church community, your larger community, your state, your country, the cosmos, that God's unfailing love never fails which is why even when you screw up in your marriage, there's still hope that you haven't lost its purpose. Because when you extend forgiveness to a, a spouse or receive forgiveness from a spouse, when love covers over a multitude of sins in your relationship, when you believe the best and build the other up, you're, you're preaching the gospel to each other. And when you blow it in your marriage by stepping outside the covenant bounds. And you come forward and say, I've, I've violated my covenant in our marriage. Or when you as an individual, aside from marriage, come to the realization that you've violated your holy relational covenant with God through your sin and rebellion and go, well, time to face the music by word, deed, thought, motive, and action, I have sinned against God, rebelled against him, and incurred the debt of death I cannot pay and make up without offering my own life. I am now here on Judgment Day to receive my due punishment. And in that moment, Jesus steps in and says, let his punishment fall on me. Let, oh, you can clap for that, sweetheart. That's a good one. She's like, is it okay if I clap for the good news of the gospel? Let her rip. <laughs> when she says, or excuse me, when one says, I've done everything to deserve death, and Jesus steps in and says, let their death be my death. Let their punishment be put on my punishment. That's the good news of the gospel. <coughs> And that's what gets preached and proclaimed in a covenant relationship that says, come hell or high water, we're staying like God stays with us. You could not run so far away that you turn around and find him there waiting to forgive. Which means every time you elevate the promise above self, you appropriate the gospel. Every time that you stand on God's promises, you're pulling down God's power in your life, which means, friends, you don't even have to leave your home to preach the gospel. 
You just got to fight to keep your promise. I'm going to be honest, some of the sweetest marriages I know have been some of the hardest, who have just clenched their teeth and said, I'm staying. We are working this out. And I believe God's power flows to two people who say, we're in and we're not going anywhere. Part three, the blessing of marriage. There are so many blessings that flow into a marriage that's living out its essence and purpose that it was hard to narrow down. I put it into eight. I can't get into it now. I will film a separate short talk and share these with you both in video form and in written form so I can get to the end of our time. <laughs> this is Mike Taylor. I met Mike Taylor seven years ago on this day, 2017. We met for the first time in the Wild Huckleberry and we shared pancakes the size of manhole covers. <laughs> and we quickly discovered our, our, our common love for food and business. And he was a, a delightful man. And, and I got to hear some of his story and just an incredible story. He'd grown up apart from God and not in a Christian home, had gotten into drug, or excuse me, alcohol, addiction was late into his young adulthood, late 20s, and life was on, 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 the, on the rack, went to Chelan to a treatment center, left clean, is hours out of rehab, driving down Chelan Highway, sees the sign, jobs, pulls into a little building with a sign that says, to milk family-owned orchards over the top of it, Walked in, met Tom Matheson, said, I'm going to be honest, just got out of rehab. I'm about three hours clean looking for a job. And sweet dear Tom Matheson took a risk on, on him and said, I'll, I'll give you a job. And Mike was all excited because he thought, hey, I'm going to have some money for food. Didn't realize he'd have to work for a month before he got paid. So while he was working to prove to Tom he could stay clean and do his job, he was dumpster diving throughout Wenatchee trying to feed himself until the end of the month. Flash forward 30 years later, Stimilt's grown a little bit, and Mike's been a huge part of that story. Dear friend of the family, executive C-suite member of the team. But while on the outside Mike was successful, on the inside Mike was rotting. Mike would tell you in his own words, he was prideful, he was arrogant, he was materialistic, and he desperately needed things from Tiffany she couldn't give him, and he was moment by moment draining her of her soul, life, even as he was pursuing things of the world until God, through a series of friends and city group life and an Easter sermon, grabbed his heart and Mike gave his life to Jesus and got baptized. A couple Matheson boys there cheering for him. Dave Hale, his UW college buddy in the, in the Greek system, baptized him there. On the Sunday, we celebrated the money that was raised to buy this property through Mission Advance. That inaugurated what has become a deep, uh, uh, deep and precious friendship. We would go on many adventures together, and we jumped into city group life together, even walked through the loss of two homes burned to the ground. It inaugurated a, a, a longstanding tradition of birthday double-date dinners at my favorite Los Comparos Mexican restaurant in Leavenworth. City group life together, hanging out with a stronger men group, building guns for each other, having fun in our home, goofing around with with Mike and Tiffany, who obviously love to have a good time. And then they hit year 23 of their marriage, and it all fell apart. Tiffany was still walking with a limp from her Catholic hangover days and the guilt and shame of starting a blended marriage because of the child she'd had out of wedlock, and all that came with that was catching up with her. Mike was still looking to her for his preeminence, and her buck bucket was, was draining dry. She had nothing left to give him, and he needed more, and they literally began eating themselves alive until year 23, they hit an impasse, and she said, I'm gone, as in, I have a plan, I have a destination, I have plane tickets, and my bags are packed. And he, in desperation, called my dad, said, what do we do? My dad sat down, met with him, and it began the process of working to see if their marriage covenant could be restored. And I remember one particular Sunday, excuse me, Saturday on the phone with them over FaceTime. They were at home. I was at my home. <coughs> it was still very much 50-50 as to whether or not the marriage would work. And as we began talking 
about, okay, what can we do, and how are you doing, and, and what's Dad said, and how's that working, and Tiffany, where are you at? Mike made a comment in passing. I don't even know if he remembers. And what he said was this, gosh, I just did the math this week. We would have been the first family in my line or Tiffany's to make it to 25 years. And to think, we've come so close and might not make it. And in that moment, I watched a resolve come over Tiffany's face and a resolve come over Mike's face. And they looked at each other and they're like, you know what? We're freaking staying. Come hell or high water, we should figure this out. Why would we have wasted so many years not to stay and to see if God might do a work? And they resolved in that moment to pull their covenant up into their life and to stand on the promise of their covenant to see if it might hold. And 10 months later, I got to sit in the front row and witness the first wedding ceremony of our new chapel as they exchanged vows of renewal on their 25th wedding anniversary. They made it. We celebrated through dance and party at the Sanctuaries, and we ate so much steak you thought we'd wiped out the cow population in Washington. That's all their friends and family that came around them to celebrate. And now Mike and Tiffany are on a new path. Mike and Tiffany have a joy in giving and serving that had always been there on, on the peripheral, but was always getting swallowed by their own self. And then a year or so later, Tiffany began struggling with the old Catholic hangover shame and the stuff and the guilt and just couldn't get un, un, unleashed and set free from that stuff. And she realized, you know what? I've been focused on Mike getting right with Jesus. I still need to get right with Jesus on a deep soul level so that I don't look to him for my preeminence. I don't look to my looks to secure his love. And Tiffany went through a deep soul cleansing to the point where she said about six months ago, you know what? I got sprinkled as a kid in the Catholic church and that hasn't done me a lick of good. I want to give witness to the good news of the gospel that I've been washed clean, that I've been made white as snow, that I'm a new woman who doesn't have to look to the outside beauty for affirmation, that I can cultivate an inner beauty, an inner beauty that could actually bring something to the table. I, I, I'm a new person. And God began just surgically, lovingly putting her soul back together that culminated in two weeks ago, Tiffany being baptized by her husband in the same room, Town Toyota Center, where Mike got baptized seven years earlier. Come on, look at that. Woo! That's a picture of a renewed marriage. They are currently 28 years in, and their story will be, gosh, the first 25 years are pretty rough. Rough. But the last 45, I heard him ask for 50 more. The last 50 have been so, so sweet. Friends, the law of preeminence, Jesus first, spouse second, and the law of promise. Come hell or high water, we stay. It's a beautiful thing. So Father in heaven, I pray your blessing over these dear, precious people. I ask in Jesus' name that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit where there is pain, hurt, brokenness, that you would bring forgiveness, life, redemption. Where there are those who feel stuck, you would unleash them this morning. Where those, there are those who feel stale, you would infuse life through this teaching. And Father, you would impart to all of us more resources, more tools, more revelation to build stronger marriages. Father, thank you for designing marriage in such a beautiful and precious way as to be a relationship like no other that we can participate in, in both proclaiming the gospel and receiving the good news of the gospel. Father, go with these dear, precious people as they prepare to eat hamburgers and hot dogs in a few minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, everybody. Pastor Josh here. One of our hearts at Stronger Man Nation is to help you build a stronger marriage. To that end, a bunch of you send in questions in relationship to this sermon, and my wife and I answer them on our Stronger Marriage podcast. You can check out right here if you'd like.